I'm Roger. I'm an alcoholic. Roger. So we're since October 11, 1978. The title of this tonight is The Roots of Addiction, or The Root of Addiction. And the reason um, that's there is because every time someone comes out with some little ditty, people that know me send me all this stuff to read. And uh, this guy wrote an article, The Real Root of Addiction. And his, his premise was, was lack of connection. And he had run some experiments with rats. And he took two rats and put them in a crappy environment. And they had a heroin-laced decanter and a regular water decanter. And overwhelmingly chose the heroin. Then he put them in a nice environment. And the, the people, the rats... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> the rats' um, use of heroin went down about 80%. His conclusion is, is that what the rat really needs is just a sense of connection, right? Well, that's fine, except when you take that over into what we suffer with, how does that, that doesn't explain the person that grew up in the perfect household. No alcoholism, no drug addiction on either side as far as, and all of a sudden, Patty just turns up goofy. You know? <laughs> Had all the advantages anyone could ever have. I mean, I don't think. Uh, I like. I think the. I think the conclusion is right. Connection, lack of connection. I get that, but I'm. I'm going to take you through this, um, in a way that. Uh, well, the way I'm thinking about it, and and you can decide what you decide about it. It's, you know, as per usual. Um, when we come here, we're no stranger to connection. I had an incredible connection with ethyl alcohol. I had an incredible connection with lying. I had a lot of connections. So if connection was the deal, right? So we come here and we start out with the first layer of what appears to be the problem, which is I have, I have a problem with this substance, right? And we think, there it is. I have a drinking problem. I have a heroin problem. I have a cocaine problem. I have a meth problem. So the solution, therefore, is to stop that. And we stop that, and uh, we, we uh, have the experience we have, and, and maybe we run into some of these 12-step meetings, and, and someone comes along and says, hey, you need some help. You look like you need some help. Let me take you through the steps. Okay, I'll take you through the steps. And so what starts out to be my consciousness, the drinking problem, I start to have a new awareness. There's other problems here, which is the second half of the first step. There's an unmanageability. And I don't, mean, I don't mean that I can't make money. Maybe that is it. But it doesn't have to be it. What it means is I can't manage this. I can't, emotional, I can't manage the emotional landscape that I'm living with. I don't know what to do when something happens that I don't like. I call those things bad things, by the way. That anything that's, that doesn't conform to my agenda is a bad thing. <laughs> Because I have an agenda, and the agenda is, of course, to keep me happy and safe and prospering. And things happen that interfere with my agenda. I call those problems. But I don't have a way to manage that. They irritate me. And you know what? They don't come in a linear fashion. And they don't come sequentially. It's not like, okay, it's Monday, new problem. And then you have all week to solve the problem, and then Monday there'll be another new problem. My problems have baby problems. They birth more problems, right? So I don't have, I don't have. I wake up, I'm having a great day. I don't know how I'm having a great day. I wake up, and some of you have had this experience. I wake up, and all of a sudden, all the color goes out of everything. We call it depression. I just wake up, and it's like, oh. You know, I see people nodding. You know what I'm talking about. It's like, Ugh. Now it's, it's a chore to get out of bed. It's a chore to get dressed. It's a ch everything is a chore. And when that gray came, I didn't know why it came. I didn't know where it came from, what its source was, and I didn't know how long it was going to stay. But I knew I was going to have to endure it until one day I woke up or one day I turned the corner and something else happened and it wasn't there anymore. And that could be a day. It could be six or eight months. So I'm starting to get, I'm starting to get the idea that maybe there's more here than drinking and drugs. It's vague. They take us through this power idea and the decision in two and three. Um, <laughs> important, important ideas, 
but I can only embrace the idea that with the consciousness I have. You know, I'm, uh, I'm 30 years old. I've been a devout atheist for 18 years, evangelical sort of. And uh, I have done everything I wanted to do when I wanted to do it, with who I wanted to do it, and the quantities I did it since I was 14. And now you're trying to introduce me to this idea. And, and we know what the idea is. One of the organizing principles of this whole thing is your self-reliance, that thing you have counted on for everything, has failed. Not a little. The word they use in the book, utterly. Utterly. And then they go on. <laughs> I hate this. <laughs> and then they go on to say, you know, we're describing a hopeless condition. Hopeless condition. I read that for years. I didn't know even what it meant. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't absorb that. I can't be hopeless. Look at all this crap I've done. <laughs> Look at all the noise I've made. <laughs> I can't be hopeless. That's not it, isn't it? No, I'm hopeless. I'm starting to get this idea. Body, mind, spirit. Spirit was a big idea for me to get a hold of because I didn't believe I had one, <laughs> right? Which is why I didn't believe I needed to do the God thing because I didn't believe there was a God and I didn't believe there was a spirit that would connect me to God. I thought, this is it. You do it. You play it as good as you can and you get done. The lights go out and it's over. So get all you can while you can because that get, that achievement, that competitiveness, that striving, we call it when we're being nice, <laughs> But it's really, I need, I need. When we look at the basic instincts, social security, sex instinct, it's I need. It's not I want. I desire. It would be nice if. No, it's I need. Like I need. Which means if I don't get her or him or it when I think I need it or worse, deserve it, game on. And I'm a, I don't even have a control mechanism for that. It's all happening. It's, it appears automatically. So they get me into that fourth step to look at these ideas a little more closely. The fourth step, in a really simplistic way, is the story I've made up to justify the mess I live in. That's what it is. It looks like a bunch of resentments, a bunch of people that have hurt me and threatened to hurt me. It looks like a bunch of things I'm afraid of. And those are true on a level. They are true. <coughs> but what's really driving this whole thing is Roger has never felt safe and he's never felt acceptable. Or you could go slash lovable. Never. And I've been, I got tricked into thinking that if I could get enough applause, enough money, enough sex, enough awards, enough achievement, somehow that would fill this up. <coughs> and it clearly it doesn't. Right? So I'm getting... <clears throat> a new idea. I find I have relationship problems. I mean relationship with everything. I have a relationship with human beings. I have a relationship with my mother, my siblings. That's one level of relationships. I have a relationship with the wife I have, if I have one, or the girlfriend, or the boyfriend, depending on your persuasion. But I have those inner circle things. Then I have another circle of relationships with the people I work with. Then I have another circle of relationships with the people I have to interact with because I'm going to the theater. I have to interact with this schmo giving the tickets out. Oh, fine. Um, but I have a relationship with money. I have a relationship with sex and sexuality. I have a relationship with ideas. And they're my ideas, which is what makes them so wonderful. <laughs> My pristine intellect has come up with this construct, and I am willing to die. I am willing to die rather than consider I may be an error. There may be a little flaw in the grand plan. It just, it's appalling, right? So I'm getting this idea, and I start getting deeper into what's causing this, and what's causing it for me. And it's, it's, in the, it's in our book, all over the place. It's self-centered fear. They call it self-centered fear. Selfish, self-centered fear. It's all about me. That's selfish. It's all about me. 
we might be having a conversation, but there's a reason we're having the conversation, and it's about me. You know, it's like the guy is saying, oh, enough about me. Why don't you talk about me? <laughs> I'm tired of talking about me. You talk about me for a while. You know, it's... It, and it's, I, it's totally transparent to me. And, and when, they, when they take us through that third step decision, remember they give us the actor analogy, the guy who wants to not just, not just be the actor, but I'd like to also uh, do the lighting. I'd like to do the staging, and I'd like to do a little directing. So I'm going to give you your lines now. And we do that in life. I gave people their lines. I gave them their roles. I didn't tell them. And then when they disappointed me, on the list, on the list, threat. Note to self, does not play well with me. <laughs> does not listen, does not obey. And the only reason is because I haven't found a way to explain to you the genius of my plan sufficiently. So we'll have another chat now, right? And it just goes on and on and on. And there's a conclusion in there. And they ask me this question. They say, even, Roger, when you're being your best, Roger, your kindest, your most generous and helpful, Roger, at the end of the day, what's the result? Confusion or harmony? Dissonance or peace? And the answer, which is breathtaking for me, is dissonance. And it's because my motives were never right. I never gave you anything. Everything I gave you had a string tied to it. I'm going to do this for you. You're going to do this for me. I just didn't tell you what you were going to do for me. So the plot's thickening. And then I go talk to someone about it, fifth step. I go talk to someone about it, and in that conversation, I hopefully get some insights. Hopefully, this person knows something about these basic instincts. Because what I've learned from this in a really simplistic way is anytime I'm upset. You know, in the big book, it says, anytime you're upset, there's something wrong with your spiritual condition. That's fine, except if you don't know you have a spiritual condition, we need another starting point. Right? Every time you're upset, Roger, it's because something appears to be threatened that you want or you want to hold on to. Two fears, right? I'm not going to get what I want. I'm going to lose something that I have. All under that umbrella. It's so simple. It can't possibly be true. Because <laughs> I was looking for a very complicated answer because I thought it was a very complicated piece of work. I wasn't complicated. I was just nuts. And the only counsel I had was me. So now I got a nut counseling a nut. What are you going to get? <laughs> nut squared? <laughs> nut times 10, right? But it's, it's, we laugh because we know it's true, but we don't see us doing it. Well, I have trust issues. That's why I don't tell anyone what's going on. I have trust issues. Of course you do, because you're untrustworthy. I had trust issues. I trusted no one. You know why? Because I was not trustworthy. That's why. And so I projected my image of me onto all of you and assumed you were just like me. Not true. But I didn't know that. I didn't know that until I had the conversation with the guy in the fifth step. was not what I anticipated. And then they go to six and seven, which is driving me into this God idea, which is very, very, very vague to me. In the beginning... Whatever that power was, was the difference between when I was throwing up blood and now I'm not. And then it was, I'm not throwing up blood and the obsession is gone. Whatever that thing was that intervened, you can call it God, you can call it the Holy Spirit, you can call it Jesus Christ, you can call it a higher power. I'm calling it a freaking mystery. Because I cannot grab any of those Labels. I cannot grab any of them. There's too much emotional charge to them for me. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying for me, I couldn't go with God or Holy Spirit or Jesus. I couldn't go with that. I couldn't even go with the Creator. I couldn't go with any of that. Because all those things I had preconceived ideas about, and I had made my mind clearly up long ago. So what I'm being put in front of continually is, have you considered the possibility that you, perhaps you're wrong? Jesus! 
No. It can't be that. Let me just tweak it and try it another way. Right? No. I was wrong. I wasn't wrong about one or two things. I was wrong about everything. And when I finally got to the place I could say, wrong, 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 it was quite liberating. I got to the place where I could say, I don't know shit. Now I'm open to some ideas. Now I'm teachable. A little more teachable. Right? So, was it the booze? No. Was it the ideas? No, not really, because there's something under that too. And I'm, I'm slowly starting to dance with this God idea. And part of the technology of that, of course, is prayer and meditation, of which I have nothing to bring to the party with. I mean, I have no concept that's workable. I have a concept. It's just totally inaccessible. All I knew about meditation was what I'd seen in the movies. And there was a, a movie in the 50s or 60s. I think it was called Lost City or something. It's Himalayan Monastery. And all I remember about meditation is a little guy in a diaper out in the snow, <laughs> about a foot above the snow. <laughs> so when you said meditation, that's what I saw in my mind's eye. Well, so, I mean, no curiosity, no examination, just wholesale, well, I can't meditate, clearly. I mean, I could go with the diaper thing. I mean, that's a look, <laughs> but I, yeah. And uh, the prayer was worse, you know. Uh, in my family, we quit going to church because, it turns out, in retrospect, because my mother was embarrassed because my father smelled like scotch, and we would sit in the front, and he'd fall asleep, and he snored. And he didn't snore like a little. He snored like a group of people. <laughs> and my mom would be elbowing them, and pretty soon we weren't going to church anymore. And she'd always watch the morning televangelist stuff. And, and their prayer was, put your hand on the glass. Put your hand on the TV. We're going to straighten your curly hair. We're going to curl your straight hair. We're going to get rid of your buck teeth. We're going to get rid of your liver spots. We're going to get rid of all that. And send 20 bucks. So this is the concept I'm working with. All I have to know is that doesn't work. I don't have to do battle with it. I don't have to mean because what I know about prayer doesn't work. It doesn't mean prayer doesn't work. It means I have not found an effective way to do that. I don't even know what that means. What is that? It seems to me it's a bunch of people reciting shit together <laughs> in various poses. Some, some on their knees, some prostrate. I mean, I don't know what it is. And... Uh, it's interesting, um, you and I were talking about Greg Braden. And he goes to visit the monastery, and, and the, uh, the head lami in the monastery, he's allowed into the prayer sessions. And these guys are praying and meditating 10, 12 hours a day. And there's incense, and there's butter lamps, and there's chanting, and there are bells. And he's going, what are you doing? What are you doing? With the, what does all this do? How does this turn into your prayer? He said, this is not about prayer. This is to create the feel to be the prayer. Energy. It's an energy. It's an energy. Then years later, I run into Thich Nhat Hanh and he's saying, the energy of prayer is this. First, you have to have a relationship with what you're praying to. And second, you have to have the right energy. The energy he describes is sincerity. Honest willingness. Um, honest seeking. Honest reaching. Um, that's all. And so, who cares how you pray? The question is, do you pray? Yes. Now, the second question is, do you like the results? Do you expect results? I do. I expect a lot. And, they, and this is kind of a confuser, isn't it, in the fellowship you hear? Expectation? Premeditated resentment. <laughs> well, you know what? If you tell me you're going to be at my house at 9 in the morning, that creates an expectation. Okay? If you're not there at 9 and you don't call, that creates a problem. <laughs> that creates a conversation. Right? But, okay, fine. But here, relative to the God idea, what time is it? Relative to the God idea, I do everything I read in the book 
That book and other wisdom text says, if I, to the best of my ability, get in right relationship with that power, whatever you call it, with that power, I can expect to have what I need. I can expect to be held. I can expect a modicum of peace. I can expect direction and purpose, okay? So, that's how I assess my prayer life, by the results. But I can't do that unless I have a concept I'm working with. Something, anything, fine. That's where you start. Because you can only start where you start. You can only be where you are. You can't be where someone else has been doing something for 15 or 30 years. is. You can't be there. They can say, look at it, it works. But you can't be there. So I have to answer these questions for myself. What is prayer? What is meditation? Do I have that? Have I done, in, in our vernacular, these steps, have I done these exercises? If I have, I'm cleaning up my past, the restitution of 8 and 9, and I'm living from a new platform, 10, 11, and 12. That's a new place to come from, from this point on out. And that involves three things, prayer, meditation, and self-examination. That's the whole thing. We use prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with the power. So it keeps going deeper and deeper, but it keeps going more in and in and in. It's within. It's in, inside. These things live inside me. And what happens with the steps is I create room for new ideas. When those, that room is created, what I found for me, I don't know if you found this for you, but what I found is companion to that was I got curious because there was a point at which I had to say I'm going for it I don't believe it I'm going for it I believe it's true for you but it's not true for me yet I haven't done it so I'm starting this thing out on nothing but faith I'm there's an amalgam of people I've met that profoundly demonstrate decent human being living type things, which astound me, because I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to get to, to the day without lying. I don't know how to pay a bill. I don't know how to deal with warrants. I don't know how to pay taxes. I don't know how to function. And there's people here that are functioning at what I consider to be a high level. And I bought it. You, Not all of you. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I'm not stupid. <laughs> not all of you. But over time, the testimony of a number of people that were around me, I bought it. This is really real for you, isn't it? You're really doing this. This, this isn't bullshit. This isn't what you say on Monday night from 8 to 9. You're actually living this. And you're, you're, you're telling me it works. I hear you're having problems with your kids. I hear your cancer came back. I hear your cancer went away. I hear you got divorced. I hear you lost the business. I hear you got remarried. I mean, I hear all these things, life events going on. Someone dear died. Someone dear got sick. I hear all this stuff going on, and you seem to be going through this with an astounding amount of equilibrium. It's not that it's not serious. It's not that it's not sad. It's the difference between I am sad, which is a, which is a statement of my totality, and I have sadness. I'm not grief. I'm grieving. I'm not depressed. I have some depression. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm not fear. I do have some fear. I have some areas that are not too, too healed up yet. But you, so I'm. This thing just keeps peeling me and peeling me. <laughs> so I have a relationship. At the end of the day, the big relationship I have with is with this, with ideas. Now, we all know this. You cannot predict the next thought that pops into your head. See? Hmm? You get what I'm saying? <laughs> you don't know the next thing you're going to think. But what this teaches me is I have a choice of which thing I grab and nurture, which idea I give safe harbor to. This is the problem with resentments, isn't it? Especially when they're real, justified. That was a Poopy thing. <laughs> Anne wants me to clean up my language. <laughs> Poopy. No more shit. Poop. <laughs> 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 
well, you got to laugh a little, right? And I say, you know what? Not just. Not fair. Not appropriate. Not correct. And I'm right. I'm right. But I'm also miserable. And this thing happened to me 30 years ago. And I've recreated it on a daily basis almost thousands of times. And it is not that awful thing that happened now. It's that awful thing times 10 or 100. And I don't have one of those or two of those or 10 of those. I got a couple of hundred of those. And I wonder why I'm not happy. That's it. You make some strides, you make some progress, and your history, that history, pulls you back and says, don't forget. Don't forget. And then you go, oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, right? That cynicism says that happiness you're feeling, that's bullshit. The other shoe's going to drop, that's going away. Not true. But that's what that false self says that I built up over the years. So I'm just saying for me. I'm not saying for you. So I get into this prayer thing, and I start out using words, don't you? Don't most of us use words? Then I start asking, what do the words mean? Then what does that meaning mean to me? And some of those things then got enlivened. They kind of came alive for me. And I used them for a while. Because, not because they were the magic. It's the, it's the monastery. It's the bells. It's the incense. Because they created an environment in here where I could just get a taste, just a peek of that higher consciousness, that, that relationship with the divine, that relationship with the other thing, that mystery, that magic, that, that thing that's everywhere but is nowhere. Like that thing. You call it God, that's fine. I call it God. You call it the Holy Spirit? I'm, absolutely. Right? Creator, absolutely. Yahweh, absolutely. Whatever. But is it real to me? Because I'm betting my life that it is. I need to establish a relationship with that thing that is impervious to this three-dimensional world. It has nothing to do with how much money I'm making or whether my car's working or it's rusty or not or whether she comes back or leaves. It has nothing to do with the apparent woes in my life. I have a relationship with a set of ideas. There's an energy in those ideas, and you know it. There's an energy in fear, isn't there? Anytime you get into a form of fear, procrastination, worry, doubt, acute concern. I wouldn't call it fear. I'm just very, very concerned. Um, all Worry, doubt, anxiety, all forms of fear, right? It's my belief in the absence of that possibility in that moment. In that moment, fear is God. It is the defining energy in my life. You know this, this is another tell. Anytime you're afraid, anytime, I know I'm speaking with a broad brush, but that's my way. Anytime (laughs) I'm afraid. Fear always contracts. Think about when you get afraid. You don't go, God, I'm scared to death. Oh, I'm terrified. I think I just peed myself. No. Fear contracts. And it might not even be physically visible. But your ideas get smaller. Your options narrow. You sit down in the chair a little bit. You back off in the corner of the room. You just, you just, it shrinks. And love or hope expands. So I know what pool I'm swimming in by how I feel. Feel. Feel good. Feel good. I'm not bulletproof. I'm safe. There's a difference. (laughs) When I thought I was bulletproof, I was scared all the time because I thought someone was (laughs) going to test it. (laughs) Right? But I'm safe. In other words, I've got myself to a place in my consciousness where you can't hurt me. You can disappoint me, but you can't hurt me. Because I don't have an unrealist expectation of your behavior. I expect you, someday, you may disappoint. Maybe not me. Maybe I'll see you disappoint someone else. I expect, someday, you may not be truthful. You may lie. I expect that. Because we're all in different stratas, different layers of this stuff, right? And we can all say, oh, we're all in recovery. Yes, we are. Come to my meeting. 
<laughs> we're all in recovery. We don't appear to be reading the same book, though, or working the same steps. <laughs> and I was that guy. I know. I was in the room. I was not in the program. I was in the room encased in my ideas and heavily defended against any assault on those ideas. And at the same time, dying. Because I did not have a solution. So get it, fear contracts, love expands. If you take this into just the, the realm of principles, forget religion and dogma and, and labels, just principles. When you act out of lower principles, the energy of fear, the energy of resentment, how does that feel? Like no one's ever had a resentment. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> right? It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel safe. And it, it tends to promote planning things like revenge. Oh, we call it a karmic episode, really. Not really revenge. <laughs> and of course, I'll be the dispenser of the karma. <laughs> because at the end of the day, I am the God, right? No. So, i got to learn to play this. I think we have given in us what I call an emotional guidance system. Some, another synonym for that might be conscience. Another synonym for that might be fundamental idea of God. Divine sense of self. Divine essence. But every one of us knows when we're doing something that's not right for us to do. Every single time you do something you know you're not supposed to do, you know it. You know it, but it's the still small voice, isn't it? It's not screaming at me going, Jeez, don't do that for the 3,430th time. Haven't you learned anything? It just is like a little, little quiet thing in me. It's, oh, I think that's a good idea. It doesn't yell at me. It, in fact, it doesn't talk to me. It sends me signals. One is stomach. My stomach gets a little twisty. So if I don't pay attention to that, I get a little nauseous. And, and then I, my muscles in my neck get stiff. And then if I really don't pay, I sweat. And the way you get over that is you blow right through it and you go get what you wanted. Just get the hell out of the way, conscience, <laughs> or whatever you are, because I'm going to go get this. Because I've told myself a lie. I've told myself, if I get this, I'm going to be okay. If I can get this woman, if I can get this relationship, if I get this kid to act right, if I can get this spouse to act right, if we could just get along, I'll be okay. I need to be okay regardless of that. I need to be okay regardless of that. And I think ultimately that connection, if you take apart ideas, if you, if you, those of you who are neuroscientists, I know there's at least 20 in the room, um, we come down to chemical, neurochemical reactions, responses. There's a woman named Candace Pert who wrote a book years ago called Molecules of Emotions. And with PET scans... And the, uh, the neuroscience, they could, they could see the part of your brain that fired up when you got afraid, and they could measure the chemical response of the brain. And they could tell you what the chemical composition of that fear was. <laughs> Interesting, they did it with joy, they did it with pleasant things, they did it with negative things, right? And so they, found, they got this beautiful database of emotions and their chemical composition. Here's the interesting thing. The lifespan of emotion is about 60 seconds. In 60 seconds, that chemical disperses back in to the brain. What do you call it? What Cranial fluid, what is that? What? No, no, no. No, 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 the fluid that your brain floats in. Brain membrane, it goes back into your system, is what I'm saying. Is it dissipates, goes back into the body, right? What that's saying is then, when I get afraid, if I can just go, oop, I'm afraid, and then back up, in a minute that's going to go. So why is that I've spent my whole life being so uptight? I'll tell you why. Because you stimulated that fear in me, and then I kept tweaking it. I kept it alive. I kept it alive. I kept it alive by feeding it, by stimulating it, especially when you've been harmed. This is why resentments are so juicy, especially when you're right. <coughs> but down the road, you understand that is an emotion, and it is corrosive to your well-being. Also, it is offensive to the spirit you don't know you have. It is death by a thousand cuts. 
And when I understand how bad, how unhealthy, how damaging that emotion is, I am moved to find a way to not live that way. So I got this. I got this life of justification and rationalization accompanied with severe loneliness, isolation, hopelessness, and futility. Or I got this thing over here that you say you did. I have no experience of that. I have no experience of it. And I think, well, I don't, I don't think everyone, but for me, for sure, this is what happened to me. I kicked this around for a long time. And about three years into my sobriety, I sat in a meeting and I heard myself say, I wonder if I just did it the way they wrote it, if it would be different. Because I'd never done it the way they wrote it. And I never got the results they said they got. And because of that, I thought the steps didn't work for me, which was totally impossible for me to see was I had never done the steps. I had done my steps. And all I had was evidence that Roger's 12 steps are inadequate (laughs) because there's really not even 12 of them. There's about two and a half. And that has not worked well to support my new life, right? So when I take that leap, I'm not doing it because I believe it. I'm doing it because I hope it's true. Where does that hope come from? That hope is an energy, isn't it? That curiosity is an energy. Where does that come from? So I think the guy was right about connection, and I think he was right about community. But we've all had, we've all got community. The question is, what is my community? When I talk to a gangbanger, a guy that sold his wife to his friend for an eight ball, they had community. They had community. You talk to these gang kids, they all have, I feel safe here, I'm accepted here, they love me. I don't get that at home. Community. That's not enough. I have community. I have a recovering community, right? More or less. Some of it's recovered. Some of it's less recovered. It's kind of weird. But I have a community where I have these conversations. That's a good thing. But that's not the ultimate connection. The ultimate connection is with the God thing. And that's purely, for me, energetic. It's purely energetic. I feel the presence of my creator the most when I talk to you. Uh, What I'm doing, what am I doing? I'm testifying. I'm bearing witness to what I found here and how it's worked. And so as I do that, I feel that power flowing through me. And I go, that's God. God, I haven't lied all night. (laughs) That's clearly God. (laughs) Right? So I know it's real. But you don't know it until you do it. And then you do it and you assess the results. And instead of going, this sucks, it doesn't work. If I'm not getting the results that these other people I've been watching or reporting, I'll go up and say, tell me about that. Tell me about your experience of six and seven. Tell me how you pray. What do you do for meditation? Do you really do this inventory on a daily basis? Isn't that a little extreme? <laughs> I mean, didn't you drink on a daily basis? I mean, didn't you lie on a daily basis? Why is, it, why is this so hard? You're used to doing things on a daily basis, just nothing constructive. Do you really start the day with those silly little books? <laughs> oh, little catalog. I mean, you hear all this stuff, right? And there's nothing wrong with ritual. There's a, I got my chair. I got my cigarettes. I got my coffee. I got my books. And this is the order I read them in. And I got my highlighter. All that's fine, as long as it takes me somewhere. If I just do it so I can check the box, I get up and leave, it's all in the chair. I hit the street and I'm me again. And I'm thinking, this is where I don't have a practice. I don't have a practice. But on the other hand, we're practicing all the time. I said, I don't know how to meditate. I've meditated my whole life. My meditation was, where's mine? (laughs) Yeah, but think about it. Meditation is a point of focus and concentration. Ultimately, that's what you're doing with meditation, is to try and get a total concentration at this point in time, this moment, this now, the essence of this moment, that's concentration. I've been doing that my whole life. Just been out, out here. It's never been in here. So, where's my girl? Where's my girl? Where's my girl? Where's my new truck? Where's my new truck? Where's my applause? Where's my money? Where's my contract? 
Where, where? What the hell's the matter with you people? Where's my stuff? Right? I've been meditating my whole life. My primary meditation was, you're a loser and you're not safe. They're going to find out. <laughs> I didn't know that. Shame. I am bad. I am broken. For me, it was, I'm not lovable. I don't know what I've done to deserve that status, but I have concluded, and this was decades before I ever drank, I have concluded that something is not right with Roger. And you know what? You're never going to be happy. You can try, but you're never going to be happy because ultimately, you don't deserve it. You've been disqualified. And I brought that into recovery. I believe you got well. I believe you got well. I believe it worked for Diane. Donnie. But I don't believe it can work for me. And the reason, if you ask me why, is because I don't deserve it. Bullshit. You deserve it. But you won't know until you reach out for it, right? So, community is important. Ritual is important. But what's ultimately important is results. Do I have an idea of this God thing? Do I have a conscious awareness that's developing? Not that's full-blown, but that's developing. I have a sense when I'm writing, when I'm walking in the right way and when I'm not walking in the right way. I have a sense of that. And where I feel it is in here. I feel it in here. There seems to be an enormous amount of latitude we're given to screw up and not go backwards. Not drink. Not that. I mean, just screw up. By screw up, I mean, I I get, periodically, I get to make myself really uncomfortable. Have fun. Right? I'm going down, what is the, the metaphor we use in a broad highway? Broad highway. And then all of a sudden there's a little vibration in your butt. That's the rumble strip. That means you're getting off the highway. Oh, I can handle this. It's just a little buzz. It's just a little vibration. Then pretty soon it's on the other side of the car. And then I'm down in the ditch and I'm going, oh, shit. This is, well, I can handle this. I've driven drunk like this. So this is fine. And the next thing I know, I'm out in the cornfield somewhere. And the car comes to a screeching halt. Dust flies up. I climb up on the roof and I go, how the hell did I get here? One idea at a time. And I had the warning. I had it, but I didn't know how to read it. That internal guidance system, conscious, if you will, divine center, divine essence, I know. And I believe every person in this room knows when they're doing something that's contrary to what they think they should be doing. I'm not saying we have all the same moral code. What I'm saying is you have a moral code. You have a sense of right and wrong and fairness and just. You have a sense of that. And when you violate it, you feel it. Now, if I keep violating it and I keep producing the emotional turmoil that comes with it, I am going to reach for an answer for that. Ethyl alcohol is a great answer for being uptight, for being scared, for feeling less than. It's a transformer. It's a spiritual experience, isn't it? Because everything that was wrong disappeared And now the real me, the me that's always been in here, has come to the fore. (laughs) Dance with me. This is going to be fun. When that happened, I didn't think this is a problem. This is a solution. So I established a relationship with an energy, an idea, a community, a drinking community, a drug-using community, a stealing, a lying, a robbing, a criminal community where I felt safe. Our book describes it as lower companions. We like to go where I can drink and I can go, at least I'm not as bad as Jim. (laughs) Oh, Christ. (laughs) Right? At least I'm not as bad as Kevin. As long as I got someone further down the road, I can feel a little superior and like I got a sense of control. And I go, well, if I ever end up looking like Mark, I'll quit. (laughs) Right? If I ever get that bad, well, then you get that bad and you go, well, I don't mean like that. I mean, that was clearly a mistake, a bit of misfortune. That's not really real, right? It'll have to, it'll have to happen three times consecutive, yeah. consecutively for it to be real. Just an anomaly. I don't know how I ended up in this squad car. A nice guy like me. So, I think he's right. It is about connection. And I think we have a deep ache for connection. And I think it is an ache for connection with our creator. That's what A talks about, the God-sized hole. And nothing will fill it but my relationship with God. God of your understanding. God of your choice. But relationship with that higher authority, right? So that ache. All these flaws. All this ridiculous stuff I've done in my life have all been things to point me in this direction 
to get the relief I was always looking for, getting the connection, the relationship I was always looking for. And I got it, but it wasn't with a person. It wasn't even with a set of ideas. It was this thing that I come to call God, and, and there's ways to access it, and there's ideas, and, and yeah, we can intellectualize it, we can talk about it, but ultimately you've got to be it. You don't talk it, you be it. And when you get in that consciousness, that being, you will know how to act. It comes with the principle. When your principle is dishonesty, you don't have to think about how to be dishonest. You know how to be dishonest. And so when I choose dishonesty as an organizing principle or intimidation or manipulation, I know as soon as I choose that principle, I have an array of things to choose from, techniques and tools. Hmm. It comes with the idea. And so does the emotional energy. And what I do is I've chosen ideas that have disconnected me from that real power, that real source energy, that thing that I've been always looking for and couldn't find. Goals. Had goals. Achieved goals. Because my promise was you get the goal, you're going to be there, and it's going to be fine. What's that mean? This emptiness is going to go away. This sense that you're no good and you're dirty and you're broken is going to be gone. And it never was. When I achieved a goal, it was worse. Because it didn't fill it. And immediately I thought, new goal. <coughs> oh, we need a 60-second plan, not a five-year plan. Because there's a, there's a surge of desperation that comes up with that. When you bet everything on this thing, this goal, this idea, and you attained it, and it didn't fulfill the promise. This is not an intellectual process. It happens subconsciously and emotionally. I just desperately know, oops, this didn't fix it. i got to find a fix. I think he's right, community. And I think it's communing with the creator. I think he's right, it's connection. And I think it's connection with that right energy. I need clean power to operate off of. Because there's all kinds of power. You know, you can go to the clean power, prayer, meditation, Compassion, empathy, kindness, helpfulness, love, understanding, comforting. Or you can go for the dirty power. Fear, anger, resentment, depression, isolation, loneliness, futility, hopelessness, helplessness, suicide. You get to choose. But we didn't know we had a choice. Because we were always defaulting into the, dark, the dirty energy because we were fear-based. I instinctively do not feel safe. And so then my instincts say, this is what will make you safe. And we start off on this incredible escapade of trying to get things in the three-dimensional world to satisfy deficiencies that are spiritually, spiritual in nature. It can't work. It's like being hungry and taping sandwiches all over your body. <laughs> can't work. You know it from your own experience. It can't work. So I think you guys are right. I think it's community and connection. But I think it is with the Creator. Because that's the only thing that's the constant in my life. Everything. I've been sober 36 years, and lots of stuff has happened. Some pleasant, some not pleasant. Some, ugh. Some that seem pleasant that turns poopy. <laughs> some poopy turned out to be some of the greatest gifts I got. Who knew in the middle of that turd <laughs> there was a golden gift? Insight. Insight. And I got curious. And I got thirsty. And I wanted more. And, and it's good because there's no limit. There's no limit to this practice. There's no limit to what you can do on an individual basis with prayer, meditation, and self-examination inventory. There's no limit. We're the limiter. This is the limiter. And if I can get rid of those limitations, which the steps do beautifully, the first nine, get rid of some of those things, the big things that are blocking me, I can start practicing some new things. And those new things take root and they grow, and pretty soon the old ideas vanish. There's a thing um, about uh, brain plasticity. <laughs> Listen to me. <laughs> and it, well, it was an interesting thing I heard, and, and, it, and, it, and it connected for me. You know, you've, everyone here has probably known someone who's had a stroke. And you see them, a part of their brain blew up, and you see them, and they're all messed up on one side, and they're drooling, and, 
and they go away. You don't see them for six or eight months. They've gone to therapy. You see them again, and you go, oh, you can't even tell you had a stroke. Except for that little bit of drool. <laughs> no. <laughs> Seems totally, totally normal. And what they've done with the therapy is they've rewired the brain. They couldn't fix the part that was destroyed from the stroke. But what they did is they found that they could make new, new neural pathways to connect to those motor skills, right? Okay, fine. Well, my dad had Alzheimer's. And there's a thing called myelation. And, and what it is is it's kind of an asphalting of a neural pathway, a, uh, a practiced idea. And uh, the kind of Alzheimer's my dad had, the, the oldest memories go last. Okay, why? Because they've been the ones that have been practiced the longest. They are myelated. They are asphalted in. It was interesting to watch because we'd bring him to his meeting and it was like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he had a step tradition meeting. We'd give, give him a card with a step tradition. And my dad was, was a good AA guy. He was, a, he was a bunch of things in general service. He did a bunch of stuff in AA. He was, he was real, um, not perfect, real. And uh, he'd sit there and stare at the card. And when it, it was a small group, when it came to him, his head would come up and he'd start talking. It was like, Dad. Dad's back. I mean, he was totally there on the page, insight, history, the whole deal. And then we get in the car, and on the way home, I could see him fading away. And then the questions that come up, the six questions he always asked, you know, how's your wife? I don't have that wife anymore. How's the kid doing in school? He's been out of school for 10 years, or, you know, that stuff. And it was, it was so interesting to watch. So here's the deal old ideas. Old ideas are neural pathways. I have created neurological pathways that when you do this, I do this. Habituated automatic responses. And they, when you ask me, why do you do that? I say, well, it's just the way I am. Because the trigger and the response are totally automated now. There is no, there is no appearance of a choice. And what we do with our defects, our flaws, our old ideas and that crappy thinking, we don't do battle with that. We don't say, what you need to do is you need to not do that thought. No. We say, no, here, build a new road right next to it, right next to it, and we'll practice that. And over time, that old neural pathway just decays. Just like watching, a, when you go out in the woods and you see an old logging road that's all grown over, you can see there's mark, there was a road there once, but because it hasn't been used, it just atrophied. And that's what happens with our old ideas. They just go away. That's what happened with the obsession of drink. I got doing something else. I got so busy doing something else, I didn't notice. And it was removed because I couldn't remove it. And all those things I found in my four-step, all those defects of character, my flaws, those are all things I'm powerless over too. And interesting, after six and seven, it doesn't say, it doesn't say work on it. It says identify it. Oh, you're about to lie. Turn away. To what? To some aspect of honesty. To some aspect. I'm afraid. Turn away to some aspect. It just says identify it. What are the instructions to the 10th step? Ask God to remove it. First thing. Talk to someone. Second thing. Accountability and honesty. Out of that conversation, I will know, do I need to do an amend? Have I done a harm? And then the fourth instruction is resolutely turn your thinking to someone you can help. Not an AA, not an Al-Anon. doesn't say two-legged, four-legged, winged. It just says, start thinking about being helpful to someone other than you. And a funny thing, this is, one of, this is one of the great gifts of our brain. It can only think about one thing at a time. Now, we don't have any control over what it thinks, but it can only still do one thing at a time. So if I got over here, I'm worried, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. And I go over here and I practice. I go, okay, I noticed I'm afraid. Now I'm going to go over here and I'm going to practice an aspect of my faith. I'll start with helpfulness. I'll start with compassion, empathy. I'll start with prayer, whatever. I'm going to practice that. Funny, that just falls away. Just falls away. Why? Because it wasn't real. It was never real. The other thing that made it real was me focusing my attention on it. Now we're back to meditation. Where do you focus your attention? Right? It's all energy. It's all energy. Clean energy, dirty energy, but it's all energy. I had to choose. How do I learn to choose? By practice, by awareness, by understanding, and learning to make new choices. And then I build new neural pathways. 
and pretty soon we get done with that. And we've done this a long time, and we go, oh, look at I got a new life. How do you know? Because the results on a daily basis are really different than they were five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, one year ago, 18 months ago, two years ago. That's how I know results. And then I go, whatever that mystery is, I'm going for it. I'm going for it. And the more I go for it, the more I seem to get. Now, it, I learned, I got a little problem with attitude, you can probably tell. And I learned most of my lessons the hard way. You don't have to learn them the hard way. I just chose that way. I didn't know it was a choice. As I got hipper to it after about 20 years, <laughs> I started choosing differently. But the, the seed of the answer is in what you call the problem. It's what I call the problem. No, that problem is just pointing me. My pain is just pointing me. There's something not right. There's something diseased. And if you adjust your attitude, your seeing, that's going to go away. It's not real. Oh, my God. That's, for me, that was like, whoa. Can that possibly be true? Well, test it. Test it. So now I have the responsibility for the day I create. I don't blame you. I don't blame them. I don't blame the flat tire. I don't blame the mailman. I don't blame the circumstances. It's on me. I have the day I create. I'm responsible for it. Hmm. Let's take a break, wanna? All right, thank you.